I had a question, Dr. West, which you've, which you've begun to, 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 to address, which is about how we understand the catastrophe of race in the age of Obama, and how we will remember Obama uh, for those of us on the far black left. And so we know that um, one of the ways in which white supremacy tends to operationalize itself historically is that traditionally there's a period of progress followed by a retrenchment period. That in the context of the Civil War, of the Civil War we had that the progress of the Civil War, which was of course immediately undermined by the, by the retrenchment of post-reconstruction. Fast forward to the middle of the 20th century, we had the progress of the Civil Rights <coughs> Movement almost immediately under, um, undermined by the, Reagan, by the age of Reagan and then the kind of rolling back of the Civil Rights Movement. It seems to me that what's, what is particularly devastating about this moment is that this was supposed to be the yes we can presidency. Right, which means this was supposed to be the moment of progress, but it turned out to be retrenchment. And so how do we make sense of what the historian uh, William Jelani Cobb talks about as the paradox of progress? Everything that you just mentioned, that you mentioned so, so eloquently in the book, that, that what does it mean to have in the context of a black president, black attorney general, black head of Homeland Security, we still have every 28 hours a black or brown body symbolically and or literally swinging from trees. That there's something about that paradox that we have to wrestle with. And so I wonder, just in terms of what Obama's legacy will be, how would you answer the question about his failure to, what does it mean to begin a presidency with yes we can and then end with the cries of Black Lives Matter? That we are in a profoundly post yes we can America. And Ferguson and Black Lives Matter in many, many ways signals the end of that. So how, how, will we, how do you think Obama's legacy will be remembered? Not by the neoliberals uh, and the MSNBC folk who talk about he got the health care bill through, but in the eyes and lens of the black prophetic tradition, where will Obama stand? Well, that's a tough question. It's hard to say. It's <coughs> just still so close. Uh, there's one thing that one can never take away from uh, Brother Obama. He's a brilliant brother. He's a charismatic. Brothers, a lovely family. I pray for them every day. They still live in white supremacist America, too, in a White House built by black people. Uh, but I think what one can never take away is the symbolic victory of <coughs> piercing the ultimate glass ceiling uh, and the unbelievable impact they had on so many people, so many black people, especially including myself. Think of the blood, sweat, and tears of all of the struggles of those who came before. Uh, the very idea of somehow being able to walk in the White House elected uh, with a sense of dignity, a sense of brilliance. Uh, that you, you can't downplay that. I mean, I'm very critical of the brother's policy, <coughs> lack of backbone, and a whole lot of other things that deeply upset me. But given the larger scope of the black freedom tradition struggle, that symbolic victory can never be taken away. The problem has been that it did not translate into the kind of substance. And it didn't translate the kind of substance because he had certain choices that he could make. He was on a treacherous terrain. He had an ugly right wing that never, ever uh, uh, gave him any time to hardly breathe. Uh, but he made certain choices. He chose Wall Street. The meeting that he had March 2009, when he brought a kick to the 13 CEO, 13 head of, of the heads of the major banks and corporations, uh, and, and gave it as a gift and said, I'm the only thing that stands between you and the pitchforks, but I want to let you know I'm on your side. I will protect you. See, that's a choice. Saying that makes Martin Luther King Jr. turn over in the grave. That's what the Poor People's Campaign was all about. That's what the critique of Vietnam was all about. Not to tell the oligarchs of the empire that you are on their side. And what did it mean you were on their side? That unlike when Jamal gets caught with a crack bag on the corner, none of y'all going to jail. How many have gone to jail, Wall Street executives? Not one. Massive crime. Market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, predatory lending across the board. Even under Reagan, not known for being on the cutting edge of social justice, he sent 1,100 people to jail under SNL crime. 
not one Wall Street. They know that. Eric Holder comes right out of Covington <coughs> in bliss, that his clients was part of the very people, J.P. Morgan, Troy Chase, and others, who ought to have been persecuted. They didn't even have sustained massive investigation, and they got caught anyway. And all they had to do was pay money that they negotiated with the White House. Well, we want 15. No, we, we, we'll give you eight. Well, maybe let's take 10.5. Okay, that's fine. No apologies, no responsibility. The same elites that tell poor people, you must be personally responsible all the time for all your actions. Pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. You got bailouts and you got off and you didn't go to jail. That was a choice by Obama. I can't. Politically, forget him. I'm a Christian, so I'm trying to forget everybody. But, <laughs> I can't forgive him for that. But and that's just the beginning, though. You see, yeah. the, the massive surveillance of all uh, of, of all of us that Snowden and others reveal, and the drones dropping bombs on innocent folk, and the uh, defense of a vicious Israeli occupation of Palestinian brothers and sisters, all of those things for me, the deportation of almost a million people, uh, all of those things will be part of his legacy right. that he might try to hide and conceal, right. but the truth will come out. Truth crushed to earth shall rise again. Now he will have a lot of cheerleaders and boot lickers and, and ass kisses who would always highlight just the positive things. What did he do? Well, he gave out medals of freedom to so, so many black people. That's fine. He had an affordable act. Yeah, but he punted on second down. He punted on the fourth down. He didn't fight for public option. Then he raised the possibility of single payer. And he got caught with big farm pharmaceutical companies and big insurance companies who were still in the driver's seat and 35 million Americans still don't have health care. So quit lying and say it's universal health care. It's not. It's better than it was. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's not what we were fighting for. We understand compromise. You have to fight to the end, then compromise. You don't punt on the second down and say you're upset when you don't score a touchdown. And he's done that over and over and over again. So in that sense, I think that will be a part of the legacy, but I don't know what the overall one will be, because you got the Iran deal now, you don't know which way that's going to go. You got Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a reshaping of the whole world economy in the interest of the transnational corporate elites. And it's going to have a devastating impact on working with poor people. And that won't kick in until after Brother Barack is, is out of office. So I think that's the beginnings of a conversation. I think in terms of just black people, I think that large numbers of black folk are going to go into post-traumatic stress uh, after yeah. Barack leaves. Mm -hmm. After Miss Michelle and the two precious children leave. You know what I'm saying? Eight years of this presence and our poverty rates are higher. Schools are more privatized. Our communities are more gentrified. Our elites are more scared. Our professionals are more niggerized. Because that's also what has happened. See, there's been an yeah. intense re niggerization of the black professional class, which means it's all really about pomp, circumstance, image, red carpet. That's right. Doesn't translate on the ground. That's right. The folks suffering. That's what it is to be a black professional. Yeah. And it's niggerized because. You really just scared to tell the truth mm -hmm. about the cycle. You're only concerned about your individual project. And that's the last thing. You know, one of the moving moments in a uh, powerful home going, Mayor Barack. Mayor Barack was one of the good freedom fighters that I did. I didn't always agree with that, but he's always on fire. But uh, Haki Mahabute, another mm -hmm. great legendary figure walked over to the coffins. Some of you may have been there. He said, Mary, we struggled for 50 years, but I hate to report the Negroes are back and they're in control. We lost. <coughs> like that. Mm -hmm. Tears in his eyes. And what he did was those who were willing to defer too uncritically to the powers that not tell the painful truths about the hell that poor and working people are undergoing. And by poor and working people, I don't mean just some homogeneous block. Right. We're talking about our gay brothers, our lesbian sisters, our bisexuals and trans whose humanity is being trashed systematically. We're talking about our poor children. 
Can you imagine almost one out of two of black children living in poverty? The richest nation in the history of the world. It's not just black president, it's any president. What is going, what are we thinking about? The soul murder taking place in the schools in Chucky cities every day? These are, these are our precious children. If, if people hadn't fought for me when I was five, I wouldn't be here. The least thing I could do is do all that I can for those precious children. It's not just black, but I start on chocolate talk side of the town. That's where I proceed. Because, of course, to succeed in America, it does help to love everybody but black people. And they're wrong with loving everybody else. But if you're loving everybody but black people, and you're black, something sick going on. Keep sweating over something, something just ain't right. <laughs> that's kind of logical. Yeah. Yet that's a way in which success can take place. And so, in that sense, I think that's also going to be the challenge. But the beautiful thing is that the wake up, the wake, the wake up, and stay woke is, is, is happening, and it's you know it's, it's a blessing to be a very small, small part of it. Because I'm old school, I don't understand a lot of the new, new school. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, that new, I mean, because what, what's so powerful. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. that I saw that, MTV that video. Kanye, like, you know, I, <laughs> I, I couldn't understand. <laughs> well, I, let's, let's go right there. Because part of what you talk about, you talk about Black Prophetic Fire as a love letter to a new generation. And so, you know, if we talk a little bit about some of the differences between uh, the approach to activism that the mo so-called Moses generation took, the civil rights generation, right, versus right. the approach to uh, that the millennial generation, the so-called Joshua generation, um, has taken. So we know that the post-millennial millennial generation has done a better job of eschewing and rejecting the politics of respectability. And that's something to uplift them for. On the, at the same time, I wonder, if Dr. West, you would agree that there are important lessons that the new generation, the so-called new generation, could learn from the civil rights generation that we don't talk about enough, in, in the sense that there are certain challenges facing black millennials and black activists in, in, this, in this 21st century moment that Malcolm and Martin and Fanny and Ella Baker could have never dealt with, one of which has to do with, you talk about in Democracy Matters, these three fundamental dogmas sucking the life out of the American democratic project, escalating authoritarianism, aggressive militarism, and free market fundamentalism. When we look at the state of activism today, where we have on the one hand the Black Lives Matter, which is so vibrant and alive, but even at moments, there are times where we <coughs> see activism reduced to a kind of market. Even in the context we talked about in, in, in our last class, walking down 125th Street in Harlem and seeing I Can't Breathe t-shirts. And as much as we want to uplift the legacy of, of Brother Eric Garner, in what way can we do that without reducing the last words of a dying man to a commodity? Mm -hmm. And so how is it that this new that this those three dogmas that you talk about are affecting every aspect of American public life, including how we understand activism? That act, activism itself is sort of up for sale. Mm -hmm. People measuring influence oh, by Twitter absolutely. followers. Yeah. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, I mean, we've always had commodification. Best Smith had the yeah, 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 right. get the blues out, right? Yeah. But we've never had the, the, the scope and the depth and the breadth of it and the intensity of it. Uh, uh, and it's 24 7 now on TV, and we've got the so called social media in which people are constantly communicating.